All righty. It says we are live. Guys, we'll give it a second to breathe. Hello, hello, and hello there, Broncos country. And it's once again time for another episode of the Mile High Insiders. I am your host, Nick Kendall. And with me today, of course, my good friend, colleague, partner, Luke Patterson. Luke, how you doing, bud? I'm doing good, Nick. I'm doing really good, but I'm on the left side of the screen right now. I'm used to being wow. on the right, and you know, I usually bother John about that. So I'm I'm battling through obstacles, man, but I think I'm gonna make it. You gotta be able to do that, man. It's uh what's the word? Resiliency. So things got to be switched up, but that's that's life. That's how it is on the football field. That's how it's going to be today. Uh, tonight's live stream podcast is brought to you by sportsbetting.com. Broncos country gambling is now legal in the great state of Colorado. And here's what makes sportsbetting.com a no-brainer for sports fans. They have sharp odds and low juice. They have in-house bookmark bookmakers, and they're not a third-party provider of odds. Reduced juice, best prices, 24-7 live customer service. Always a real person in the United States to answer you. Here's the kicker. At sportsbetting.com backslash mile high huddle, you can get a 100% risk free week of sports betting up to $500. Not just one bet, but all of your bets. Play for a week, and if your losses exceed your winnings at the end of the week, sportsbetting.com backslash mile high huddle will cover 100% of the difference up to $500 with a one time rollover. So head on over to sports betting at www.sportsbetting.com backslash mile high huddle. That's www www.sportsbetting.com backslash mile high huddle and capitalize on a risk-free week of sports betting up to $500. So, and also guys, make sure you find us on Twitter at Luke Patterson LP and at Nick Kendall MHH. Make sure you like subscribe and share our show wherever you're listening to these episodes. And also don't miss our great content at milehighhuddle.com an affiliate of sports illustrated. So Luke, this podcast idea today, kicking it off. Actually, before we get into the the meat and potatoes of the episode, let's check the chat here. Let's see who's in here today. We got Joseph Milanowski. What's up, brother? How is everything going? Buana Beast. Everybody loves themselves some Buana Beast. We got James Campbell in the house. Travis Burley. We got Robert Skinner. Hello there, Broncos country. Appreciate it. Levi Hope. Levi, hope you're having a good day. And that was a lame joke. We're going to roll with it, though. Uh, Charlie Beagle coming in. My key factors are not getting anybody else hurt and scoring more points than the Yuccaneers. We love that. Um, we got Jeff Wingham coming in here. Peter Middleton. Ashton. I don't recognize this one. What's up, crew? Ashton Obadiah. I appreciate you, Ashton, coming in here. So, yeah, we got a lively section here today. And uh, the biggest question here we're going, obviously, we need to talk about the Broncos injuries. Where does this team go from here? But I'm going to kick it over to you. You had an idea for this topic. Also, it looks like you uh, cleaned up the the facial hair a little bit going on. So I I appreciate that seeing the beautiful uh, slim down <laughs> face there. But yeah. uh, Luke, over to you. What's what's what are we talking about today? What's the crux of the episode? Yeah, thanks, man. Yeah, well, uh, you know, a little debate that we've always had uh, from the draft was uh, one offensive player that I want to get into today, a rookie and his utilization or lack thereof. But the meat and potatoes of this has got to be about Noah Fant. I mean, yeah. right now, to me, Noah Fant's your number one wide receiver. Jerry Judy's hurt. He's not right. There's something wrong with those ribs. He's highly questionable tomorrow. But to me, we got to dive into this Noah Fant talk. We got to talk, you know, why he's not being utilized enough. And how can the Broncos get this former first round tight end to start balling out of control? I mean, I'm sick of hearing about Travis Kelsey. I'm sick of hearing about George Kittle. I know he's hurt. But you know what? Aaron Waller. No Getting Noah, tired of that one. Yeah. You know, are you telling me that Noah Fant can't be better than any of those guys? I don't know that he's right there right now, but at least give him the ball. So, yeah, man, I'm excited to get into it. I'm excited to wrap with you about this. We're going to touch on the wide receivers just a little bit, as I mentioned. Um, another debate that we've had going on since training camp. So, I'm pumped to kick it off, dude. So, I guess I'm going to say straight up, man, and I think you're going to agree with me, Noah Fant. He's just not getting the ball. I mean – he seems to be doing well, and then they go away from him. And you look at his 2020 season, and it's pedestrian at best because he should have double the numbers. I mean, he's got nine catches for 138 yards and two touchdowns. Uh, he should have at least four touchdowns. You should have at least 20 catches if you're Noah Fant. I mean, the guy has been open a lot of times. I'm not sure that Pat Shermer really knows what he has with Noah Fant. Maybe a little bit of hyperbole there with uh, if at least four touchdowns, that's you're talking about two touchdowns a game average and he would break George Kittle's records. I mean, that's just <laughs> getting two touchdowns a game. We're talking about a freak, but I think probably going forward, the biggest thing is targeting him more. Like you said, Jerry Judy's dinged up with a rib injury. Jeff Driscoll uh, 
left them out to dry a little bit over a, a pass over the middle. Uh, KJ Hamler, a great first game. I'm really excited to see what we have this week. But with Cortland Sutton out for the season with a serious knee injury, Noah Fant has to be your number one passing option. So that means not only scheming him the ball in one half, but both halves and repeatedly going to him. I mean, it was something poetic last week. I know the Broncos lost, but Noah Fant making Devin Bush look extremely pedestrian. Looks like he was running in you know gravy with Noah Fant flying by him on the touchdown and the two-point conversion. But got to get Noah Fant the ball more. He's your... I would argue, I mean, if you put him against KJ Hamler, KJ Hamler is a more explosive receiver, but KJ Hamler is going against cornerbacks where you're going to have Noah Fant against linebackers. So your most explosive, your best mismatch is Noah Fant in the pass game. And you just got to do it more. You got to go to it more. It's something that you need to get to him at least once a quarter and then go from there. But if you're going whole quarters halves without featuring Noah Fant at this point, I don't know what you're doing. Yeah, no, I hear you, man. And I was telling you and John before the show started, and John was saying it too. We were both really hard on Noah Fant his first year. I was really hard on him in training camp, so much that I put my foot in my mouth and called him a bust early on. Oh. Now, I was really disappointed because he came in a training camp out of shape. Uh, he's, you know, using the bathroom all the time. Seemed like he was getting sick on the sidelines, lollygagging, didn't like it. But for whatever reason, he put all that aside as soon as Drew Locke entered the game, finished the 2019 season very, very well. But, you know, I start to just hesitate a little bit with the utilization of Noah Fant because, Receivers are dropping like flies, Nick. I mean, Broncos are dropping like flies. You, you look at Cortland Sutton, gone for the year on what? Uh, blown out knee from an interception. And, you know, that going up to catch that ball with that sprained AC joint, I mean, that's got to be tough, right? When you're going up and you, your shoulder's not right. I'm sure you got the needle and everything like that. But it's just an unfortunate event. So for me with Noah Fant, I'm thinking if you guys are going to decide to go to him, He's going to get banged up a little bit. I mean, he's going to take some shots. I'm not saying he's going to get injured, but watching the Pittsburgh Steelers tape, I mean, I was a guy that wanted Devin Bush. I wanted Devin White. I really did. But there was no way the Broncos were going to be able to get Devin White unless they traded up to go get him. So I was comfortable with the Devin the Devin Bush projection to the Broncos. Uh, but Noah Fant absolutely torched Devin Bush several times going back and looking at the film. I mean, so those guys are going to be forever linked. We talked that about about that a little bit last week. Um, but Noah Fant, man, get the guy at the freaking ball. Yeah, I agree. And back to the comment section here, we got more names coming in. We got George Cruz, go Broncos from San Antonio, Texas. We still believe never give up on my team. Love that, George. We got Eli Flores coming in. What up, Broncos fans? What's up, Austin Eli? Mendoza, the first time making the live pod. Austin, thank you very much for joining us today. Welcome we to MHI, Ellen. Austin. We got Gina Ellen coming in. We got oh, um, that's my wife right there. I got oh, say, what's up, babe? What's up, babe? Looking good. Looking good. And my kiddo right there, Layla. What's up? Looking good, y'all. We got Greg Smith in the house. Good evening, fellas. Hey, Greg. And, uh, Paul Jackson coming in. Quincy Kishan. So we got a lot of names in here. Some that I don't recognize. Man, That's awesome we- to see. That's really great. Um, we really appreciate you guys again. This is the Mile High Insiders podcast. If you guys are joining us for the first time, that's the show. You can find us on Twitter at MHI underscore football pod. And if you like these lovely hats, go to huddleuppod.com and uh, get your swag on. So we got ours right here. But no fan, obviously, get him the ball. That seems like the obvious thing now. Uh, I'm really excited to see. I think the Broncos maybe should take a page out of the John Gruden playbook. I think given how they're dropping like flies and utilize Noah Fant and KJ Hamler, kind of like how the Raiders are playing off of Darren Waller and Henry Ruggs. Obviously, uh, KJ Hamler is not exactly uh, Henry Ruggs, but he might be pound for pound just as explosive. It's close. So if you can utilize those guys each, uh, together, and I know Henry Ruggs hasn't been making huge statistical uh, games, but he's drawing coverages right now. He's creating space for Darren Waller. So you need to play those guys off each other, especially if Jerry Judy is out of this game right now. He's listed as questionable with a rib injury. Yeah, well, it, you're exactly right. You got to figure out how to get KJ Hamler involved. Noah Fant yeah. is making these opportunities glaringly obvious. Uh, sometimes they're just not going to him for whatever reason. So, uh, yeah, KJ Hamler, I was really impressed with his first game. I thought he did well. I thought he showed a lot of courage. I thought, you know, he made his his 
fair share of mistakes. Uh, his footwork was a little sloppy on some plays. And uh, overall, though, I like the young guy barking at the Steelers. You know, I like the young rook getting after Minka Fitzpatrick. I mean, I don't know how smart that was, but I liked it a lot. He's got that chip on his shoulder. But, you know, one thing I, I have to ask you, Nick, I mean, I – I like Noah Fant against a safety in the deep route. I really mm -hmm. do because I consider Noah Fant a receiver. I mean, he's he's a big-bodied receiver. Uh, I think he's put a lot of focus and more craft in his overall game. So what's that do for KJ Hamler? I want to see some slant routes, man. I want to see you get behind some linebackers and torch them. I want to see, you know, that mismatch. And for a lot of safeties, Nick, it's hard for them to cover these bigger tight ends that are coming out faster and faster in every draft class. I guess I want to kick it off to you. What do you think about that? I mean, how would you utilize KJ Hamler and Noah Fant with their routes? Are you looking at short routes, medium routes, long routes, burners, screens? I mean, both guys are really different. So tell me how you need to use them. Well, I, this is an interesting week for the Broncos going up with Noah Fant. He's probably going to have one of his toughest matchups of the entire year this week because Tampa Bay, I think, might have the best duo of linebackers in football uh, with Avanta David and Devin White. So yeah. Noah Fant's going to have a tough game getting at separation. I do think, though, that if you can isolate Noah Fant against either of those guys, he's bigger and faster than them. I mean, he really is. So a lot of times the defense will have bracket coverage or anything. So I'd love to see Noah Fant maybe flexed out wide, maybe with uh, KJ Hamler in the slot and see some slot fade action. Because if, the, if they have to switch and the linebackers carrying KJ Hamler down the field, I mean – Good luck, <laughs> even even if it's Levante David, who's probably the most underrated linebacker in football over the last decade, and uh, Devin White, who everybody knows. So I think that's the way to go, obviously, getting them involved. And when you have the tackle issues that the Broncos have right now, you're not going to see as many long passes, especially with Driscoll's accuracy down the field. Uh, but right now, that's kind of what I'm going for. Ideally, you're going to see more uh, slot fades from Hamler. But the big question is if if – Judy plays last week. We saw Judy actually get more slot snaps than KJ Hamler. It looks like Judy is actually the guy who's going to be the primary slot weapon. And I'm worried about that, Nick. I'm not worried because of the drops that that doesn't bother me. I'm worried about his focus in the middle. Uh, I, yeah. I mean, I know that the guys are professional. I know that he's probably his hardest critic. He's very humble. He's very soft spoken. Um, it, odd for a wide receiver, right? Just doesn't seem to fit the mold. Uh, but I like Jerry Judy. That being said, man, I'm going to ask the question straight up and I can get hate for it. And I really don't care. Is Jerry Judy afraid to go over the middle? Because I, I just don't understand some of this disconnect, you know, and I wonder a lot of times with these drops, I mean, are you afraid you're going to get hit? Are, are you trying to look for, to make a play before you even have the ball? I mean, sometimes it's paralysis by over analysis. And I starting to wonder about Jerry Judy just a little bit. And now he's got the rib injury. He's definitely not going to want to go and get hit by Devin white in the middle of the field. Uh, that's assuming Devin white's able to catch up with Jerry Judy if Jerry Judy plays. So Nick, what do you think about those concerns? What's going on with Jerry Judy? Well, one of my concerns with Jerry Judy coming out was that you did not see many contested catches. Now, granted, that's a symptom of his route running. He can get separation extremely well, especially for a college player. And especially when you have Henry Ruggs, Jalen Waddle, Devonta Smith, Tua Tagovailoa throwing you the football. So, I mean, Jerry Judy, if he was playing from the slot majority of Alabama, and there weren't many times where they had to throw it to him in contested situations because either somebody else was open or Jerry Judy was extremely open. So this is the NFL. That's not going to be the case. He's going to have to show contested catches. So th that's just something to be wait and see. I mean, we can't know at this point. It's the same with his hands. I mean, especially when he, when it's a little bit in traffic, sometimes he's looking to either secure the football too soon and turn up field and make a play or just not following it all the way through to his hands. So we've seen a couple of big drops from him already uh, doing that. So it's going to be interesting. I think, Jerry Judy, the biggest question for me is his ability. Those those are big questions. But from the slot to the outside, how proficient can he be getting off the press when you have the sideline as an extra defender? It's much easier to get off the press as a slot player because you can go either way. When you're outside, you can't go out of bounds. So the, the, the cornerback is much yeah. easier for them. Yeah. Uh, so that's, I mean, with Cortland Sutton out now, you're going to see this week how the, the cards are going to be shuffled. And I'm really curious to see the role of Hamler and Judy, both of them aren't great at getting off press, but that you can use pre-snap motion and a bunch of different things to kind of uh, 
artificially get them off potential press. Yeah, and I'm hoping their speed is able to, you know, make up for some of that. That's that physicality, you know, that they have to beat that press coverage. So we've got a question coming in from Jillian Reese. Jill, we appreciate you joining the MHI podcast. Yes, we need to hit Hamler quick. He's definitely able to get yards after a catch and separate. You're exactly right, Jillian. We know that this guy is an absolute burner. Now, everybody's going to bring up his drops from college. And, Nick, I really don't care about those right now because we haven't seen one yet, right? Uh, I thought that he did a decent job in Pittsburgh, as I said earlier. Now, one thing that drew drove me nuts was on that deep pass that he went out, and I think he was double covered. I mean, his size is the only thing that was against his – his odds in getting that catch. Uh, the guy showed physical aggressiveness, wanting to go up, showed mad hops. But yeah, I just, I'm looking for KJ Hamler to get more involved. I just don't know if I trust Pat Shermer to get the guy involved. That's my biggest thing right now. I, I don't know what's going on with Pat. And the fact of the matter is, you got a backup quarterback coming into this offense that wasn't even firing on all cylinders to begin with. So, yeah, I completely agree. Got to get K.J. Hamler involved. Yeah, no, that's – you're definitely right. I mean, I was shocked to see how involved he was last week. Me Honestly, too. I mean, they were – Coming they were back really from a hamstring? With the abbreviated offseason even more than normal. So it's – I mean, Carl had a really hot take last week, I think. Maybe it would offend some people, but it's worth restating here that he thought K.J. Hamler looked like a better player than Jerry Judy last week. Now, one game – Obviously, that's going to change. Hopefully, game by game, we can kind of debate which one looked better, and they can uh, pick on a a weaker player. You know, just kind of play matchups. Uh, but I saw a comment coming in here. Somebody talking about what's going on with. Uh, oh, here we go. Paul Jackson coming in. Paul looks like you got that mile high huddle hat going on there. Really do like that. That's the um, dad hat too, Paul. Yeah. I like that, buddy. I like that a lot. Uh, Paul Jackson coming in. Is Noah's lack of targets due to scheme or QBs not going through their progression? Uh, you know, I, that's one of those things where it does probably fall in the middle. It's not hundred percent one way or the other. I think part of it though, has been scheme. Uh, they just have not been going to Fant as much as they're probably going to have to going forward. And also part of it is, I mean, it's the type of scheme itself. I know that a lot of people are talking about what's going on with Shermer it needs to be better, but this scheme is, I mean, let's call it as it is the right tackle position is such a huge detriment to what they can even call especially going against TJ Watt. I don't think we're going to have another matchup like that this week. Oh. I know a lot of people like to talk about Shaq Barrett, but TJ Watt's two tiers above Shaq Barrett. Shaq um, Barrett doesn't have a sack on the season. I know. By Shaq the way. Barrett. I mean, that will change your, to your point that will change this week against the Denver probably. Broncos. Yeah. Especially with Jeff Driscoll, who has very little pocket awareness, good athlete, but just kind of, I mean, we saw it last week guy coming in on him. I'm going to duck. <laughs> you got to get rid of the ball, buddy. You got to see it coming. I, I agree, Nick. And Paul, that's a really, really good question. I like that question a lot. Now, um, how do you get Noah, Vant, Noah Fant more involved? I'm going to tell you. And I think I saw it on the chat right now. Something you and I have gone back and forth. Why isn't Albert O playing? And before you hit hit me with, because I know you're going to, and you're right. You're, you're completely right. Albert O can't block. <laughs> okay. He can't block. I wasn't able to get out there at training camp this year due to obvious reasons, but uh, people that I trust, people that you trust have told you the same thing. And I believe them 100%. That being said, Nick, I don't care. I don't care that he can block. Cause you know what? No fan doesn't block either. So to me, if you get Albert O involved right now, you're already better off. What is Nick Vanette doing for you right now? I mean, I, I was so frustrated watching Nick Vanette play football last Sunday against his own Pittsburgh Steelers, a homecoming that just was completely soured by Nick Vanette's own performance. And then Jake Butt, it's a great story. Uh, I love the the comeback kid and all that stuff, but the shovel pass in week one didn't work. You're not really getting too much involved in week two. To me, if you get Alberto in, is he the right option right away? No, but you've got to find out what you've gotten the young guy because too many times the Broncos have a room full of tight ends and they're either all hurt or the Broncos aren't utilizing them the right way. Get Albert O on the field and I think at least get him on the field in the red zone because Teams got to know the Broncos are going to be looking for Noah Fant in the red zone. To me, if you get Albert O in there, maybe he's able to get just a little bit of attention and get some wide open looks from Jeff Driscoll. 
you know, the Jeff Driscoll has to find him and hit him then, which is a totally different conversation. <laughs> but, uh, James Campbell coming in here. Uh, James, good, great comment here. Uh, tight ends shouldn't be viewed as a monolithic position. Monolithic, guys, word of the day. Uh, lots of nuance and big difference between the inline Y and the move F slash big slot type and H back, even fullback type too. So that's a good point. Uh, right now, I think the biggest thing is right now the Broncos are utilizing a very dichotomous uh, di- dichotomized tight end where you have the the Y, which has been butt or uh, Vinette, who is more attached to the line of scrimmage. I agree with you. Neither of them have been blocking like they should be considering they're the Y uh, and then the move F type. But I just think, are you putting Noah Fant in that Y position to then put Albert O in the F? I, j- I think you, you're moving your best offense pass weapon when you're doing that at this point. And you definitely don't want Albert O as that guy who's attached to the line of scrimmage. Well, if you want, okay, you're you're exactly right, and I agree with you there. So, uh, I th- I think you said you you know Jerry Judy's projected to be in the slot, and he is. So you're right on that. Now you also said you'd like to see Noah Fant maybe out there flexed out a little bit wide, right? Yeah. Okay. So why can't we get Albert O as just your traditional Y then? Because uh, Noah Fant would truly be playing that that wide receiver position. Um, I'm not saying it's going to be perfect. I don't know. You know, just because Albert O had a had a great training camp in terms of catching doesn't mean he had a great training camp in terms of impressing the coaches. So I think that's something they've got to get over, and that's something you've told me as well. He's got to overall improve his game and i get that and maybe some of that's the classroom but i was just gonna say i've heard some of that is the playbook side of things okay so obviously that's going to keep you off the field if if your uh playbook is going to be limited while you're out there they're not going to do that for albert O. okay and just to get you on the field they're not going to limit the playbook so to me though you know i i want to be optimistic about this team but they're staring down tom brady here in week three uh We'll get to our picks at the end of the show here, and I know you guys can go look at them at milehighhuddle.com where the MHH staff gives our weekly picks, and we've got them on there. But you got nothing to lose to me. I mean, you really don't. I mean, teams that go 0-3, they don't get to the playoffs, Nick. The stats show that. And, I mean, do you really feel – anyone that feels this is a playoff team is just off their rocker because they need to get their first win before we even get on that synopsis. So, uh, Nick, where do we go from here in terms of this offensive plan to beat the Bucs? We talked about getting Noah Fant open. We talked about getting K.J. Hamler open. What else can the Broncos do? Uh, Well, I'm really concerned with the the A-gap. Specifically, I think Lord Cushenberry has been struggling a lot yeah. early on. And when yep. you have arguably the definitely a top three nose tackle in football right now in Vita Vea, a 340 pound nose tackle from the University of Washington out here in Seattle. Yes. And on top of how the Buccaneers like to blitz up that a gap, mm-hmm. uh, that's that's a recipe for disaster with Lloyd Cushenberry. So maybe this week you're going to see more short passing. I think it was Kenneth Booker with a great comment uh, saying that. Uh, Gordon and Fant probably have to be the focus of the offense this week. I agree. I'm also looking to get KJ Hamler involved. I'm also looking to get Tim Patrick involved. Uh, I'm going to pivot this a little bit here just yep. for a second because yep. you and I had a, a fair mm-hmm. amount of debates uh, this offseason as to which Bronco would have the the bigger impact and was the more valuable player between Deshaun Hamilton and Tim Patrick. I believe that Deshaun Hamilton with Noah Fant's ability to hit the slants and t- uh, Shermer with the more West Coast style offense. I thought Hamilton would finally break out this year. Well, guys, it's coming up. You know, he had a a two and a six uh, on in his hand in Texas Hold'em. You know, just not good for Hamilton. Cortland Sutton being out, there's whammy number one because you have already two quicker, smaller, shiftier wide receivers healthy that are going to get the ball more. That's what Hamilton does. And then also you have Driscoll, who's not accurate. I mean, again, he's got a good arm talent as far as velocity. He's a good athlete, track star, uh, but just the ability to progress things mentally and also the accuracy. I mean, it's, it's bad for Hamilton. So I, we have debated Hamilton versus Patrick this season. I definitely concede Ham, going forward this season. Patrick is the guy who's going to come out just, and I think it's largely because of the situation around him. 
Yeah, I mean, how would you have known? No, nobody's expecting anybody to get hurt unless you're a Broncos tight end, which is why I'm so worried right now, just because they have that history. Um, but but you're exactly right, Nick. I mean, you would agree with me, I think, in saying that Tim Patrick is much more of that traditional alpha dog receiver that Cortland Sutton is. He's the big bodied guy you want in the one on one mismatches. I want to see those vertical jumps, things like that. He's not a burner. He's not going to get anybody, you know, on a juke move or anything like that. Yeah. But he's a journeyman wide receiver that um, I trust. And that's on a weekly basis because I'm always looking for him to improve. He's had some games where he's a complete ghost. Others where he's been very, very consistent, including that Minnesota Vikings game last year. I, I was a breakout game for him then you just really didn't hear much of him since um so yeah i, I agree tim patrick he's he's got to be getting some more some more reps out there just because of the situation now deshaun hamilton i still think he has an opportunity to resurrect whatever career he wants to have in this nfl um the opportunities are there and he's gonna be on the field tomorrow you're gonna see him out there and i just hope the he can make the most of it. I mean, at, at best, Tim Patrick, you know, provides sound run blocking as well. But That's, I was going to say, yeah. So, so anytime a wide receiver can block on the edge, who's a big bodied physical dude, coach wants him out there. So, uh, I think Pat Shermer absolutely likes Cortland Sutton. He likes those big bodied wide receivers. He really likes the athletic ones, but I think he's starting to appreciate Tim Patrick a little bit. So we got Greg Smith coming in. I love the shirt. Let him hate. I know you got that from my high huddle. I love the way you keep it 100% real, Luke. No sugar cutting it sugarcoating it with you no i appreciate that man um that's that's with all of us though and i'm going to speak for nick carl all the other podcasts uh our whole mhh staff we give it to you real our opinion and there's no orange and blue glasses here um we want this team to win every single week but if you ask me if they're going to win sometimes that's a different that's a different conversation or if you ask me my personal opinion on what i think's going on you're going to get a different answer and sometimes broncos country doesn't like that answer and i'm okay with that we never need to agree but that's why sports are so great nick we're able to have these little debates we're able to get after each other without no one's feelings getting hurt or anything like that man so i appreciate that comment appreciate you guys so much yeah, absolutely. Really do appreciate that. We got Pabby coming in with thirty-one dollars. A Justin Simmons drop. Go Broncos, Pabby. Hope everything is going well Hi, in Des Moines, Iowa. Say hello to the Hawkeye State for me. Um, really do appreciate that. And let me see. We got James Campbell coming in. A uh, question for you, Nick. Which QB has more NFL potential? K Kyle Trask or KJ Costello? Ah, man, I guess Kyle Trask. I really don't like KJ Costello's mechanics, but. Uh, that's something that I'm going to don't hold me to that. That could change by the time the NFL draft comes around. Obviously we have a lot of season left to see, so it's going to be interesting. We got speaking of that, Milton coming in. As yeah. Well. Speaking of that, Nick, I want to, I want to interrupt real quick guys, go over to milehighhuddle.com. Nick wrote a really good piece. Speaking of quarterbacks in the next NFL draft, I'm not going to give it away, but it's a very high profile quarterback that everybody knows his name He's won some national championships in college he does some big things outside of the sport as well so you should know who i'm talking about get on over to milehighhuddle.com and look at nick's article it was an awesome article nick really loved it so i hope we don't have to have that conversation later on man but uh we're gonna have to see so yep sorry to interrupt but peter coming in james i think they were impressed in the first week and didn't want to risk him they need to activate him. Keep Albert O red shorted. So we got Peter coming in, agreeing with you, Nick. Uh, Albert O is not quite ready. Obviously, the playbook, uh, hearing that and thinking about that and confirming it with you, that's the biggest thing then. If you're not yeah. trusted to know the playbook and your uh, mental assignments, it's going to just – you're not going to get playing time. Yep. I mean, it, that's that's really the simplest thing. I also think if the Broncos are 0-4, again, we're, we're talking about – which is very possible, but, I mean, heading out – East Coast, let's say they lose to Tom Brady this week. What are they? Five point five dogs right yep. now. That's what I saw last. Maybe it's. I think it's money's on the the Tampa Bay side as well. Guys, go to sportsbetting.com backslash my huddle to bet on the Broncos because I think they'll cover. But uh, they just cover at home. Uh, I mean, even if they're look how close I got with the Steelers last week. Uh, so coming back to the original point though, I think if they are zero four with a long week, 
to prepare for that week five game. I know it's the Patriots still, but I think that's probably at that point, that's when I'm going to be calling for the youth movement if they are 0-4 at that point. Uh, so Trey Lance, Trevor Lawrence also don't sleep on Justin Fields. I mean, if the Broncos have a top five pick this year, you have to look at quarterback. You need the nuance. You need to know how Locke plays down the stretch. That's going to really influence it. But I mean, it's just, that's the conversation that we're going to have to have if the Broncos are picking top five, which is what the article is about, not calling for any specific player. So um, I think that's the biggest thing. And we got to see how the season plays out. I still think this Broncos team, too much fight, too much talent. Uh, I don't think they're going to end up picking top five, maybe in that six to 10 range, but top five, I think there's a lot of bad football teams in the NFL this year. Uh, so yeah, conceding you to Tim Patrick, I think probably we need to have a little station identification here real quick. Uh, guys, this is the mile high insiders podcast. We really do appreciate you rolling with us today. Uh, it's MHI underscore football pod on Twitter. Uh, biggest thing you can do for us, subscribe, like, and share on YouTube, uh, leave click those little thumbs up as we like to say on Facebook and, uh, guys, the mothership at mile high huddle and affiliate of sports illustrated. Uh, so I think the direction we should talk now, oh, we got Kenneth Booker coming in, Hello, popping up from the chat, the, the light color. Um, it pops on there when you do that super chat. Uh, I'm a lock guy. We need to tackle out of Oregon. Otherwise Lawrence will end up just like lock injured. I mean, you never know. You see guys who get beat all the time. I'll put it to you, to you like this. I know that Wilkinson is a huge issue, but like, I think the offensive line, like Arizona's offensive line, the Seahawks offensive line are less talented than the Broncos. You're not seeing any issues with them. Mm. Uh, hmm. across okay. the board they're equivalent or i mean the bronco the biggest thing with the broncos sure. is they have a total sieve at right tackle and that messes up everything when you're playing an f player sorry elijah wilkinson you're horrible at tackle uh but i think across the board the broncos talent on the offensive line is at least equivalent to that of the seahawks or of the cardinals but those two teams are killing it and i'm not worried about their quarterbacks getting hurt uh yeah you're exactly right and that's interesting too because uh People consider Drew Locke an athletic mobile quarterback as well. So uh, immediately I want to push back and be like, well, they've got Russell Wilson and Kyler Murray who, you know, Russell Wilson is the hottest quarterback in the league right now. I mean, I'm the way. Good <laughs> Lord. I mean, unlimited. Yeah, he's yeah. unlimited. <laughs> so Russell Wilson's absolutely killing it. So my first argument to that would be like, well, you got, two great quarterbacks that are able to move around and make space. But you know what? Drew Locke's able to do that too. But for whatever reason, Elijah Wilkinson just cannot figure it out right now. Lloyd Cushenberry, he's going through those rookie growing pains. He's had a tough couple of games. Overall, I think his game one, I'd say, was fair. Uh, C minus or so, probably week one. But it was a welcome welcome to the NFL rookie moment for Lloyd Cushenberry last week. I mean, Cam yeah. Hayward, man, we talked about it. You're going to have your hands full with that guy. That guy doesn't get a lot of love. How so, about Tyson Alulu? Oh man, dude! From, from the grave, like yeah, I just, where, he's, where, he yeah. in the top ten like a decade ago. I didn't know he was still in the league. He was looking like an all pro out there. I had to Week get on my two. phone and good. yeah, I was looking up when he was drafted, and it's just like holy cow! He's another like Frank Gore type guy, you know, who's just keeping it in. But Kenneth Booker, I agree, man. I'm a lock guy as well. We got to see, you know, how this injury is going to go. And speaking of injuries, um. You know, I think we're all expecting Philip Lindsay to come back around the New York Jets game. Uh, that's what a lot of the reports are showing right now. Some stuff that I'm hearing out there as well. So Melvin Gordon, man, you need to get in the game. You need yeah. to get in the game. And yeah, Flash Gordon, all this, all that, uh, whatever. But Pat Shermer and his utilization of Melvin Gordon, I think is a lot of the problem with Melvin Gordon. Um, sometimes he's not as flashy as he claims to be, but Pat Shermer's utilization of Melvin Gordon, I was talking to you about it before the show and same with John. I'm like, man, what's did Melvin Gordon do with the Chargers? Running back screens. What's he doing with the Broncos? Not running back screens. So a lot of times you're seeing these cutesy little tight end screens that don't work. And, uh, you know, whether or not you could have wide receiver screens right now, I think depending on the matchups you can, if you don't have as physical defensive backs and you get that big body Tim Patrick out there and maybe KJ Hamler swinging back for a screen, something like that. But Melvin Gordon in the passing game has got to get more involved as well. Um, for the longest time in that Steeler game, they were pounding the rock with Garrett Bowles and Dalton Reisner on that left side. And then, you know, to the Pittsburgh Steelers credit and Mike Tomlin's credit, they made adjustments, Nick. And then after that, I mean, 
Melvin Gordon was able to hit off some some decent runs here and there, but overall, I'm not too impressed with what I'm seeing from Melvin Gordon, considering what the Broncos are paying him. That touchdown reception he had though was really nice. It I mean, Vance Williams is nothing to you know write home about at the linebacker position for the Steelers, but I mean, if you can do that, this it's just this week the. The Tampa Bay Buccaneers have so much talent at the linebacker position. I don't think there's a better duo than uh, Levante David and Devin White. So how are you attacking this team? You're hopefully, I mean, they run a 3-4. You want to isolate those edge rushers, the outside linebackers, in the pass game when they are not sending them, when they're dropping them back. I mean, Jason Pierre-Paul slash Shaq Barrett in space, those guys are pass rushers. At some point, you'll see them drop back. You need to hit them then. And then also the cornerback position isn't the best for them. They have some size. Uh, I really liked Carlton Davis coming out of Auburn, really talented running or a really talented uh, cornerback. They also have Jamel Dean, who's talented and Sean Bunting. So a lot of size, but they don't really have great slot ability. Antoine Winfield can come down and play that slot. But so if you got Jerry Judy or KJ Hamler or Noah Fant in the slot, and let's say a tight end or a, one of those linebackers isn't following them, that's the mismatch. That's where I'm looking to go. Nick, you're going to remember this too. Speaking of mismatches, uh, the undrafted cornerback out of the university of Oklahoma that went to the Buccaneers as an undrafted. Was that Patrick Motley. Motley? Yeah, Patrick Motley. Do you know if he's still on the active roster for the Bucks? Did he make the team? I do not see. Oh, Parnell Motley. And it looks like he Par- is the fifth cornerback that they have. Okay. So he probably okay. won't see yeah. that. Yeah, okay. He's a player that I actually really liked. Um, not saying he's the best DB ever, but I got to interview him, cover him down at the Shrine game last year, and just speaking of mismatches, that was uh, one Tampa Bay Bucks that I was interested in right away. But obviously the big conversation, it's Tom Brady, right? And we wish we could all see Drew Locke versus Tom Brady, but we're just not going to be able to do that. So um, Tom Brady wasn't firing well on week one, seemed to come back in week two. How do you think the GOAT does against the Denver Broncos, a place where he has a losing record? Honestly, I think they're not going to ask him to do too much. I, th- I mean, he has really good wide receiver weapons. Mike Evans is coming back from that hamstring, should be healthier than he has been all season. And uh, Chris Godwin it did not play last week. He's going to be back this week after uh, getting past a concussion protocol. Gronkowski is a good blocker. I mean, O.J. Howard's a, a really good weapon. But I think it's the running game, actually, with this team. I think they're not going to not – put Tom Brady in too much of a position. I think they're not going to respect the Broncos that much. And I think they're going to lean on Ronald Jones and Leonard Floyd or Leonard Fournette, excuse me, uh, in the run game. I think that's probably where you're going to see the biggest issues of the Broncos. And I mean, we saw a couple of years uh, just last year, Leonard Fournette uh, really hurt the Broncos. And I think it was in the past game even as well. So I, I think while they do have those weapons, Tom Brady, I think his arm is diminishing drew Brees too. Yikes kind of looks like they're starting to be that uh, last year at Peyton Manning, a little bit of the arm talent there, but I think that the it's definitely a concern. Mike Evans, Chris Godwin, extremely talented, but I'm 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 looking to isolate those those linebackers in space if I'm the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And Tom Brady does that as well as anyone. If you're Vic Fangio and Ed Donatel for me, get after Tom Brady. You got to go after him. I want you to blitz him. These young guys, guess what? They're going to get beat in zone coverage. They're going to get beaten nickel, dime, all that other stuff. They're going to get beat because they're rookies and they're going against arguably the greatest quarterback of all time. But if you're going to get beat, get beat going 100%. Knock him on his butt. That's worth the penalty, at least for me in this game just because that mentally jacks with Tom Brady every now and again, when he ends up in his, on his back, that's assuming the Broncos can get to the guy. Uh, This pass rush has been for me, non-existent. Bradley Chubb is not right. I'm very worried about Bradley Chubb. Uh, He seemed to play a little bit better and took a a minor progression against the Steelers and was more involved in the game. Uh, Week one went against, you know, just zeros across the board other than the two quarterback knockdowns. And against the Steelers, he played pretty well. But he's playing on one leg for me out there, Nick. I mean, this is a guy that's not even a year removed from his second ACL surgery, you know, that happened in October and we're not there yet. So I'm very concerned about Bradley Chubb, Jeremiah Tatu. It's a nice idea to think that he could get to Tom Brady, but um, that'll be a good matchup too. Looking at the Buccaneers offensive line with Tristan Wirfs out there. I'm curious to see how he's going to do granted against, you know, he's not going against Broncos pass rusher elite Von Miller or anything like that. Um, Tom Brady for me, go after him. What do you got to lose? You know, go 
blitz him. Get after him. I want to see Josie Jewell get in there. I know he's not the fastest but fastest player ever, but get him in there. Alexander Johnson, we know that man likes to blitz, and we know Vic Fangio trusts Alexander Johnson. He's giving him the comms. He's earning more trust by the week. I want to see... You know, I can't believe I'm saying this, but I want to see the dinosaur dance this weekend. I want to see it in the backfield from Alexander Johnson dropping 12 on his butt. Yeah, the biggest thing is when you're sending those linebackers, you're creating space and you need athletes to be able to cover that space. And right now, if you're sending Alexander Johnson, you're leaving that whole middle of the field to Josie Jewell and whoever the heck is playing that nickel position, saying Bassey, who did not look that good this past week. I was like, who's that number 36 jumping around? There was a play where he just like looked like his legs were in cement. It was not good. Uh, but um, yeah, I, th- I hear what you're saying. I think you're probably going to have to do that, but then you're going to have to live with the chance that you're going to give up big plays. And right Let's now, go, I think that, go, ahead, go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I was going to say, you're going to have to live with, uh, if you are blitzing, you're going to have to live with giving up some big plays because I know the pass rush has been average. I would say probably about average, but I'm, I'm honestly, Overall, I'm more concerned about the the back seven. I think they're playing conservatively, and a reason you're not seeing that pressure get home is because they don't have the dogs in the back end. I mean, especially you're listed, you're missing. I mean, obviously you have the two good safeties, but cornerback and linebacker, it's not good. It's really not good. I think somebody even had a comment about that. The Broncos have issues. Let me see. Here we go. Todd coming in. Todd, you read my mind. Great off, great weapons on offense, especially when Sutton comes back. Defense has some problems this year as last year. No one can cover the tight end. It's true. Although Kareem Jackson can a little bit, but then you're taking him away from other spots. Um, we need depth to cover depth at coverage at linebacker and cornerback. And that just, that level is weak. And when that level is weak, pass rush is going to have issues too. It's all synergistic. They all feed into each other. Yeah. My quite you're exactly right. My question is who's going to cover Mike Evans. It's probably going to be, it's probably going to be Oj. Yeah, I think so too. It can't be Callahan, right? I mean, just the mismatch is just too much. Um, I just, man, Mike, it, you look at the talent that the Bucks have, and you're exactly right. If you blitz and you don't get there, man, that's going to suck. You Off know, the races. if you try to play this prevent defense against Tom Brady, it's going to prevent you, all right, prevent you from winning. And it's just it to me, it's one or the other. Pick your poison. I mean, and you're just going to have to live with it. But Justin Simmons and Kareem Jackson, they got to step their games up. I know they've both been playing very, very well. Justin Simmons played much better against Great. the Steelers than he did against the Titans. Absolutely. So, um, yeah, going to have to definitely lean on their experienced safeties coming up against Tom Brady. So we got Chris Hernandez. What's up, Chris? Chris, a superstar. Love it. Go Broncos. Click those little thumbs up, guys. Be sure to do that. Go ahead and give us a rating as well on Spotify, iTunes, wherever y'all get your podcasts. The ratings mean a lot to us. We take them to heart. We read them. We are always consistently trying to improve across the board. So, Nick, we're in the final segment here, man. And it just these these always seem to go really, really quick. And we've covered a lot, I think. We've covered, you know, a little bit of defense, but mostly offense because that's what we're worried about. So before we get to our picks and stuff like that, I just want to ask you real quick. I mean, Jeff Driscoll, (laughs) you're exactly right. Not the best decision maker, doesn't have uh, the most heightened sense of awareness, but he's mobile if he's already got momentum. One theory I've heard bounced around by several people um, on the airwaves, in print, things like that. Does Pat Shermer adopt this offense for Jeff Driscoll a little bit? I mean, could we get a couple RPO plays in there? Could could we see something that we haven't seen yet just as, you know, not necessarily a cute play, but, hey, let's see what this looks like maybe for a couple plays and see if we can do that? Because you're exactly right. If you're expecting for Jeff Driscoll to be this pocket passer, uh, no way. <laughs> he probably had, I think, his best game that he's going to have this year against the Steelers, all things considered. What do you yeah. think Pat Shermer's going to do, or if anything, to assist Jeff Driscoll? Well, I think you're going to see them change the offense a little bit. Luckily, Drew Locke and it's not like you're going with a totally different style of quarterback. Drew Locke and Driscoll have some similarities. 
Drew Locke is more talented of a passer, but I mean, they have some similarities. It's not like you're going from Peyton Manning to Michael Vick where you have to completely change it. Uh, right. But I do think that they have to change the offense a little bit. Shermer has done that mid season before it's to great success. If you remember just a couple years ago with the Vikings, he went from the sand bat Bradford, very West coast offense, uh, get the ball out quick to the very play action, heavy offense of case Keenum. And it led them to the, uh, I believe the NFC championship game that season where they lost to the Eagles. So I think that you will see them change the offense. And I definitely want to see them add more quarterback power, quarterback runs, maybe some misdirection. And part of that also goes into getting these wide receivers open. You don't have this monster get off the press, you know, height, weight, height, weight guy like Cortland Sutton anymore. So you need to have that pre-snap movement with Judy, with Hamler. And part of that can play into the misdirection, getting those linebackers starting to turn the wrong way with that uh, power run game. So I'm hoping that I get a little bit more creative. It doesn't have to be the Tebow offense, but you know, just a little bit more car- quarterback power and that can help the edge as well. I mean, if you're running and that you have to hold that, uh, that edge rusher has to watch just for a second and stay back and have to, has to be disciplined. That can be make or break on a play. So I definitely think, I hope, I hope they get a little bit more, you know, the, the service academies to kind of where you see those triple options and whatnot, but I want to see them use the quarterback's legs more, especially Driscoll's legs more. Speaking of quarterback, as the show wraps up, I got to ask you, because we haven't talked about it. I mean, I've seen some of your tweets. You've seen some of my tweets. Broncos have a new quarterback. He will not be active this week. Uh, Of course, I'm talking about former first-round pick. Um, Man, I can't believe I'm going to say this. Blake Bortles is a Denver Bronco. Nick, what are your thoughts? I mean, bring it on, right? 2020 just keeps keeps on giving. (laughs) What what can you even do at this point? He's a better quarterback than Jeff Driscoll is in my opinion. So if we see him, there's, but there's also at the same hand, you have to be honest, there's a reason that he was still available. So, I mean, if he comes in, then odds are something's wrong with Locke. I think you're probably not going to see him get fully up to speed until uh, by the time you hopefully get locked back. So it's going to be the Driscoll show. Now, if Driscoll gets hurt, let's say this week, you'll have Rippon come in and that will probably be ugly of if he has to come in and play, but then you have what would happen week four. So if Driscoll gets hurt, then, you know, we'll see. But right now I don't have much thoughts on it other than hopefully we don't see him. Yeah. That terrible windup. <laughs> um, you know, people are saying that weird throwing motion or lack thereof uh, that Blake Bortles has has been evident, you know, when he's been stretching and stuff out there. I think he got into the building Thursday after all the testing that players have to go through nowadays. And, um, you know, thank goodness for that testing because we have NFL. So um, he's he's here, Nick. I mean, and and like you said, Brett Rippon, Brett Rippon's number two. And Brett Rippon, something he consistently gets praised for is his work in the classroom. So I hope for the sake of Brett Rippon and the Denver Broncos, they let him take a few reps this week um, because, yeah, that's you're talking worst case scenario. If Jeff Driscoll goes down and Nick, could you believe that Royce Freeman is the emergency number three quarterback for the Denver Broncos? I mean, that's just crazy to me, man. I'm just like, what? If you could pick any player, let's say, obviously you'd Cortland Sutton was probably the guy we saw a couple yeah. of amazing passes from him last year. Yes. Uh, but if you could play any, any player the Broncos have right now at quarterback without ramifications or worrying about taking them off their spot, who would it be? Ooh, gosh, you know, the season's gotten off the rails and this is the question we're having oh. after two weeks, <laughs> man. That's a really good question. I'm going to defer to you while I'm thinking about it. Go ahead. I'm going to be biased, but I'm looking for a guy who's a big guy with power and has athleticism. I'm probably going Noah Fant. I mean, he's a really good basketball player as well. I'm not sure how good of a thrower he is, but I mean, I'm playing wing T offense there. And if I have Noah Fant with the football in his hands, they need to get him the football in the hands, his hands more, right? What better way to do it than to make him the power Ooh. running quarterback? Oh, yeah. Uh, is there any way we could sign Tim Tebow to be the – no, I'm just joking because he'd be a running quarterback. Um, Man, I don't know. If I could pick another player, <sighs> Somebody I said guess... Wilson. Charlie. <laughs> what do you say? What do you say I missed? He said Wilkinson. Well, Elijah Wilkinson. Oh, man. Hope the big man can throw. Um, No, I'm probably going to go for a tight end as well just because they're big-bodied, they're athletic, and they can take – 
take some hits. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm going to go with my boy, Albert O because he needs to get on the field. And if that means he's the emergency third string quarterback, then I will take it. So I think Albert O coming back full circle here, Albert O we probably won't see him on the field this week, except no. maybe, maybe a little bit. We probably won't see him on the field this week. Probably won't see him on the short week of the jets. I think that week five game, it really opens up if the Broncos, if there's an injury, then, you know, scrap this out the window, which, the way 2020 is going, there probably will be an injury. Everyone knock on wood. Uh, but um, I think that that's probably the way to go. I think that if the Broncos are struggling, you you probably just have to concede the the blocking that you're going to have on the edge there just to get him reps. And, and that's just the way it'll be. Probably the same thing with the gene. Probably DeMarcus Walker will need to be unactive. And I know a is going to have some issues with weight and leverage this first year because he needs to change his body type a little bit uh, going from more of that they played three down men at or three down linemen at Arkansas. So he played kind of a heavy edge, but that's not going to be his role in the NFL. Uh, so going to have to change as well, but I think you're gonna have to take the lump. So the Broncos are owned for injured, not looking like it's getting better. Probably another year of the youth movement, uh, probably another year of not really paying attention to the wins and losses so much, but uh, we got to get there first. So about five minutes left guys, obviously we've got to give our predictions here. So Luke, I'll kick it off to you and we'll be keeping an eye on the chat as well. If you guys have anything that comes up, but Luke, um, Big quick, quick thing. Biggest X factor on the offense. If the Broncos win, just give me one sentence afterwards. Biggest X factor. The reason the Broncos win on offense. If they win, the reason the Broncos win on offense is our player that steps up like an X factor on offense, X factor on defense. One sentence after each one. Okay. Um, So the reason the Broncos win on offense is because Melvin Gordon has arrived as a Denver Bronco. He gets one rushing touchdown and one receiving touchdown. Uh, He's the mismatch in this game. You've got to have a breakout game from Melvin Gordon. Uh, The utilization from Pat Shermer showing trust in Melvin Gordon. I know Pat Shermer saying he didn't go out there and campaign for Melvin Gordon, but you know what? Uh, Yeah, you did. Otherwise, Philip Lindsay would have been just fine. The X factor for me in this game, Michael Ojemudia, man. I mean, I just... (laughs) Mike Evans, a lot of people forget he was banged up a couple weeks ago and now he's looking great and he's still not 100% yet. So I've been very, very impressed with Michael Ojemudia. I got a little grouchy last week when people were getting after him for not intercepting that ball. Well, you know what? That's why he's a DB. Okay. So let's not act like he's a wide receiver. He's going to catch every single thing. He's done a good job for being a rookie. Um, I've been impressed with him going against nasty quarterback like Ben Roethlisberger, but he's going against the GOAT. So I'm looking for him to make mistakes and bounce back for those mistakes. That's a good one. And I agree with you that a couple of plays with him were upsetting, but like unlike Yadam and unlike yeah. definitely unlike Langley, like Oja Moody looks like he belongs out there. Yes. So he's just going to get better. He looks like he, he doesn't look out of place. He's moving. Mm-hmm. He looks like he belongs. He's going to get better. So I'm not worried about him. I really am not. Uh, and I like your X factor a lot. I think my X factor, this is going to be just because of the situation we talked about it a lot, but I mean, it's no event because he's going to have to become the identity of the offense along with yes. Gordon in the past game. And now that teams know that, how does that change things? And not only that, but again, Levante David and Devin white are so good. So if, if Noah fan has a big game this week, he's arrived because the other team knows that it's going to him. I mean, Bruce Arians called him one of the best tight ends in football. So, you know, that they, their plan is going to be limit Noah Fant. And with Devin White and Levante David, they have the horses to do that. But if Noah Fant can still make it happen, especially with issues at the quarterback position or for the Broncos, then hello, Noah Fant, top five, emerging top five tight end in football. On defense, I'm going with the guys people know, but I think the best matchup for the Broncos on the defense is Jarrell Casey versus yep. Alex Kappa. Alex Kappa, the, the Buccaneers have a solid offensive line. It's not great. Uh, but they're solid. But Alex Kappa has been struggling at the right guard position. They have a really good left guard in Ali Marpet. Ryan Jensen at center is really good. And then obviously Tristan Wirfs at right tackle. Uh, but Ali, Alex Kappa, up and down. Drell Casey, I know that you're better against the run, but we need you, buddy. We need you against the pass. We got a statue at quarterback and Tom Brady. We need Jarrell Casey to show that he's around and has arrived as well. So that's the and, big one I'm going with. And you know something that's going to just – piss Tom Brady off is going to be when Jarrell Casey bats a couple of his balls down because that's something he's done in back-to-back weeks. And, and I love it. I mean, I've gotten after Shelby Harris saying, yeah, that's all he does is his bat passes down. I want to see more. Well, yeah, Jarrell Casey get to him. If you can't get to him, 
look for another batted pass from Jarrell Casey. It's something he's taken a lot, a lot of pride in. I'm going to give my pick before we get to Chris here. So my pick for this game, I'm going with the with the Buccaneers, man. I, you know, I hate to say it. I'm going 30-17. I think it's going to be a really, really tough game. I think Tom Brady is going to pick these rookies apart. Um, I think you're going to see more miscommunication and possibly clock ma- management issues from the coaching staff. It just doesn't seem like things are in sync right now. The wheels completely fall off in this game. The Broncos will be looking at 0-3 before they even get Philip Lindsay back, long before they get Drew Locke back. Well, I have the Broncos losing as well. It's really hard to pick them right now. I would not be shocked if they won because, I mean, this we saw them last week. They fought really hard, and you can give a hard time to the coaching staff, but, I mean, these players had not given up, and they had every – every reason to with all the injuries they had last week. I mean, it would be easy to see them just like toss their hands in the air and say, you know, F it. Like I'm not putting myself online. They, they battled back right. though. So that was really impressive. I think it's going to be a close game. I think the Broncos are going to still lose. I think it's going to be a, a low, uh, low scoring game overall. I think it's going to be 27 to 23. Uh, so I'm, Again, I think that the oh, we got Buana coming in saying with the win here, and Ernie saying that we're kissing Brady's behind. I hate Tom Brady. I'm sorry. I just I can't Ernie, I do him. too. Yeah, Nick. I yeah, no, him. Ernie, Ernie. But you know what, man? I love you because you're a Broncos fan and you hate him, and you know you're like Mr. B, right? We're gonna win every game from here on, and that's what the Broncos need. We need that optimism. But hey, man, don't think that Tom Brady's some washed up old scrub that's coming into the place where he's you know doesn't have a winning record. He's gonna come in here. He's going to come in here prepared do not be surprised if rob gunkowski finally gets involved a little bit more against the denver broncos they have a hard time covering those tight ends well the backup tight end for the bucks might get a couple looks so uh i know we're wrapping up the show i want to hear from you guys real quick um i'm starting to see some predictions coming out here uh 10 17 kind of game ashton i'm wondering who's taking that 17 lead broncos bucks I'm assuming I'm assuming Broncos because we're all Broncos fans here. But uh, yeah, Nick, I think it's going to be tough, man. I think it's going to be really tough. One thing I'm looking forward to, Mark Schlereth's going to be on the call, folks. He's Broncos good. own Mark Schlereth is going to be on the call. And I just hope for Garrett Bowles' sake that there's not a holding penalty because Mark Schlereth, I think his blood pressure, you know, and that neck is about to burst out of that white collar if that happens. Very, very brutal last year if you listen to Stink talk about good old Garrett Bowles, who is playing pretty well right now. I know he got a holding call against the Steelers, but, uh, man, for coming off of an elbow injury and blocking the way he did with Dalton Reisner, very impressed from at least the left side of the offensive line. Fingers crossed that he continues that. I always will hold my breath because we've seen highs from him I where agree. he will regress. So we'll see. Uh, but so far, so good. And he's been far from the issue on the offensive line. In fact, I would say that he's been the best offensive lineman they have had so far. Yeah, Glasgow has been okay. Reisner has been up and down. Cushionberry has been not good. And then Wilkinson has been probably the worst right tackle in football. So guys, unfortunately, leaving you on that low note here, uh, that's going to wrap it up today for us, uh, for Luke and myself. Follow Luke at Twitter, at Luke Patterson LP, and myself, at Nick Kendall MHH. Make sure you head on over to milehighhuddle.com, an affiliate of Sports Illustrated. Also, guys, like, subscribe, and share on YouTube. Uh, leave a like or heart em- emoji on Facebook. We really do appreciate that. Also, go to iTunes or wherever you listen to these shows. Leave us five-star rating and a comment. All those things can really help us continue to bring you these Denver Bronco deep dives. If you like these shows, obviously the Mahi Insiders, there's also Huddle Up Podcast, Building the Broncos, Dub Valley Deep Divers. We're all um, down under the same umbrella. So the other, let me see, tomorrow will be another Huddle Up Podcast with Chad and Zach. They'll be bringing it to you. Uh, find us at Twitter at Mahi Huddle and at MHI underscore or MHI underscore football pod. Uh, for Luke, I'm Nick wrapping up another beautiful Saturday night episode. Luke, what do you got the rest of the night? Oh, man, I think I'm going to wrap with some family and friends for a little bit. Tomorrow's my cheat day, so I'm going to eat fattening food and love every second of it and not feel guilty at all. Work out in the morning and get that in. And then football, man, it's football season. It's the best time of the year. We have a lot of great games, but I guess the last thing we forgot to touch on real quick, man, we're going to have fans here. At this game against the Buccaneers, man. I need those fans to be loud. I need them to get after Brady. I'm not expecting to see any Buccaneers fans there. So if I see you, I'm going to be upset. Uh, Nick, appreciate you so much. Great show. John, love you. Go Broncos.